Yes. And if you have any questions regarding exams, of course, uh, for our boot camp session, uh, you do have the opportunity to ask questions. We're going to do a Q&A session, um, you know, after the presentation. So please, if you have any questions, save them for that time, or you can drop them in, in the chat at any time. And as you're entering, please uh, mute yourself. Thank you. We have two wonderful representatives here today. We have one, Ken Williams from um, the CIS, and then we have Stuart Klugman um, from the SLA. So we got them for you. We got them here. We have them right here in front of you for you to ask questions and connect. So please do not hesitate to ask those questions or to start thinking of them. These are the people that you want to directly connect with. So. Don't be afraid to ask. All right, we're gonna give it just two more minutes, start at 5.05. And for everybody that is on the call, I guess I can just introduce myself now. Um, I am Morgan Coven. I am the Student Programs Coordinator for IABA. Um, I see a lot of familiar names. I see some new names on here. So I just welcome you all. Thank you for coming today. Um, and I hope that our session on um, exams and exam prep is beneficial to you and you know, you're getting closer to your actuarial journey. So I am very excited. I am learning so much during these sessions and I know today that we're gonna learn even more. So you can sit back, get ready, because <laughs> it's gonna be um, a great session, so. Just one more minute. We have more people coming in. Yep, and if you want to, I know um, every week or every session we have more presenters. Um, so they don't know where you all are from and where your different places you're tuning in from. So please drop in the chat, where are you tuning in from? I know I'm in Illinois. Um, I know from past sessions we've had some people from, you know, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, Boston area. We've had so many different people join the call. Um, where are you all from? I'll see Texas, Ohio, Canada, New York, the Bahamas. Yep, Boston. Yes. Oh, normal Illinois, you're not far at all. Blue Nigeria, Atlanta. Nick, one more person here, Ghana, gotcha. All right, well, if anybody else is joining the call, I'll just let them in. Um, but I will go ahead and give Ken, Ken and Stuart the floor. Um, go ahead, guys, it's all yours. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Morgan. Uh, this is Stuart Klugman. Uh, great to be with you. And thanks so much for inviting uh, Ken and I to uh, uh, give you some perspectives on the actuarial exam pathway. So uh, I am, as it says on the screen, a senior staff fellow at the Society of Actuaries. I've been there uh, for 13 years now. Uh, for 35 years prior to that, I was a university professor at a couple of uh, uh, schools in the state of Iowa. Um, and I'll let uh, Ken introduce uh, himself when, when his turn comes. But why don't we go to the next slide and, and get underway with the presentation? All right, just for background. So how do you be? Well, I know how I became an actuary, and it turns out it's the exact same way that you can become an actuary. Because one thing that's held constant over the decades is that you achieve your professional designation uh, by passing a series of examinations. 
Now the content of the examinations have changed. The format of the exams has changed. Uh, a great many aspects of them have changed. Uh, but one thing that's remained constant is this is a profession uh, you enter through a series of uh, professional examinations. Uh, in particular, uh, they're administered, uh, the ones we'll be talking about today, there are other organizations, uh, but we're here representing the Casualty Actuarial Society and the Society of Actuaries, uh, both based in the US, uh, but both have a global reach. So we do have uh, exam centers and the opportunity to take our exams uh, throughout the world. Um, they're, uh, back when I took exams, it was truly twice a year. You had a spring exam and a fall exam, and you waited six months between each one. Uh, now they're held uh, all throughout the year with varying levels of frequency. Uh, some examinations are given as many as six times a year. Um, others are still in the twice a year format um, and occasionally even just once a year. Um, typically, those are the ones that are uh, near the end of the pathway and uh, actually are more complex and actually require a good bit of study time to get ready for them. Um, so the uh, uh, less frequent administration uh, actually makes some sense. Both organizations have two levels of certification. Uh, membership as a qualified actuary occurs at the associate level, uh, whether it's associate of the CAS or of the SOA. Um, and then when you've completed the full set of exams that you earn the title of fellow of the, of your, of the organization with which you've affiliated. Uh, one thing I hope you know by now is um, you almost all actuaries uh, take many of these exams while they're working. So companies may expect you to have passed one or two exams before you start work or, or may set that as an end requirement to get an entry level job. Uh, but typically it's a, a fairly low number and the bulk of your work is done uh, while you're on the job. So it's a different sort of way to uh, get your career going and to learn what you need. So instead of a spell where you just go to school followed by a spell where you just work, you're essentially going to school and working at the same time. Only school is not a brick and mortar building with professors, uh, but is a series of examinations with study materials um, that help you learn the material and then the associations examine to see whether uh, you've mastered it or not. Um, but while you're doing that, you'll often have a full-time job and learning all the rest of what it takes to be a great actuary uh, and build your career uh, as you're completing your qualification requirements. So with that in mind, uh, let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the pathway to uh, uh, designation uh, from the Society of Actuaries. There you go. So this is our current pathway. And as you'll learn, um, both of societies are, are undergoing some changes. So this is the one that's in effect. And I'm not going to go through block by block and talk about each exam. Uh, what I want to emphasize for you is the variety of different modes we use for, for testing and uh, evaluating our candidates. So some of the components are called validation by education experience. Uh, that's where you take an approved university course or other experience and get a grade of B minus or better. The blue boxes are exams. They're very traditional. Some of them are multiple choice. Some of them have written answer components, but they're proctored exams that you take in a, in a testing environment. And both societies have, have pretty much moved fully to having that environment be a computer-based testing center where you go to a, to a location, uh, they'll sit you down at, at a computer and present the exam on the computer and you'll also provide your answers on the computer. Um, we also have e-learning, uh, which is online courses followed by a take-home project. Um, and then we close off our associateship pathway with a seminar on professionalism, code of conduct, standards of practice. Um, and so when you uh, complete all the boxes on the screen, uh, that earns you the uh, Associate of the Society of Actuaries designation uh, and membership in the association. Now, the next slide, you'll see the, the version that's new this year. So, what, oh, so it's um, somewhat the same, but a couple of things I want to point out that are, that are interesting that we added this year to the 
to the pathway. One is, uh, if you'll notice at the bottom of the first two columns, uh, oops, back up, yep, bottom of the first two columns, uh, there's some e-learning components. Earlier in the pathway, we've added some requirements to do an online course with a take-home assessment um, to uh, help solidify the material that's in the columns above them. So a chance to take uh, what you've learned in an exam setting and learn how it's relevant for, for actuarial practice. So we want uh, folks who are, are in our pathway to, to get uh, accustomed to what it is actuaries do. So if you look, for example, a course in probability, probability is probability. There's no such thing really as probability for actuaries. Uh, it's just a subject that's, that's uh, taught generically for people going into all sorts of disciplines. Well, we prefer that earlier rather than later, you find out how actuaries use probability to solve the problems that we work on. So we're trying to get a flavor of that with those two early uh, e-learning courses at the bottom of the first two columns. Um, the other thing that you'll see is different is there's now three boxes that are related to uh, predictive analytics. And the one thing that both societies have really been emphasizing the last few years, and, and I know Ken will be talking about the changes the CAS is making in that direction, is to place an emphasis on uh, data analysis, big data, uh, manipulating data, analyzing data, presenting results. So we've got three components now uh, that cover analytics, the statistics for risk modeling and predictive analytics exam, and then the advanced topics course that's uh, brand new this year. Um, the uh, other main component is something we've not done for a long time, but in the top of the middle column, you'll see there's at that stage, there's a choice of two exams, whether you go into, uh, I wanna specialize in long-term insurance or short-term insurance. So different types of insurance products and, and they require uh, different types of actuarial models and methods uh, to go with them. So, um, that's our pathway in a nutshell. So we'll be, be happy to take questions when, when we get to that point, if there's anything you've been learning about uh, the SOA exam pathway and, and would like to know more about it. Um, I do wanna make a, a couple of other comments on again, the nature of the exam. Um, mention that some of them are often, the, the upper left-hand corner, the financial mathematics and probability exams are given six times a year. And what's even better uh, for those, uh, as after you complete the exam, you find out if you've passed or failed. So you can immediately know if you're ready to move on to your next exam, or you've got to do a little more preparation to, to get that same one the next time. And it's nice to know that another opportunity will be available uh, within two months. Uh, some of the other exams also give instant results, but they're not available as frequently as those two. And as I say, we, we give six times a year. Um, something new is on the next slide. So this is a brand new this year is what we call micro credentials. <clears throat> and those things are digital badges. And uh, you all young folk out there may know how, already know what that means. It's, it's something relatively new to me, but a digital badge is something you can attach to your uh, LinkedIn profile, if you like, you can put it on your resume, uh, you can put it as a signature in your email line. But uh, this is uh, a recognition that you've uh, made some accomplishments along the way to, to earning your ASA. These micro credentials uh, do not uh, convey membership uh, in the same way, uh, but they do recognize accomplishments. And so I've got three quick slides to show you what those three are. So the next slide is the pre-actuarial foundations uh, micro-credential. If you complete those five boxes, you've, you've got the foundations to become an actuary. Other than that module I talked about, there isn't much actuarial content here. These are generic subjects that are, that are taught in, in schools all over the place for all kinds of uh, career paths, but that's a material you need to know to be ready to learn what actuaries do and how they go about doing it. So with this micro-credential, you can say, show someone that says, I'm ready to be an actuary. I'm ready to learn what actuaries do. Uh, if you go to the next slide and you also get uh, the second column, you've earned the actuarial science foundations micro-credential. 
So here you do have some basic actuarial skills through the fundamentals of actuarial mathematics exam, statistics for risk modeling, and the, another e-learning module on applications. So after this point, you might be ready to, to say uh, assist an actuary who's doing work. You're not uh, close yet to being ready to, to work on your own um, and be handed projects to do. Uh, but you do have enough background where you could work with an actuary as you're learning uh, how to do more. And then the third one we've carved out are, is called uh, Data Science for Actuaries. It's on the next slide. And uh, completing uh, those three gets you the third digital badge, and that uh, represents that you've completed all the analytics components. So you're in, you have the data science background uh, to do actuarial work. There's obviously a lot of actuarial background you would also need uh, to apply it to actuarial work, uh, but this uh, is a signal that you've made it uh, to that point. Um, on my next slide, um, and I'm definitely not going to go through that one with you, but this is on our website. It's just the transition requirements from the old exams, so in case you've passed something under the current system, uh, this shows how it translates into the new system. Um, and I won't uh, belabor that much longer. Uh, and instead, I have one more picture before I turn it over to Ken. And so what about becoming a fellow? So I don't go into great detail on this. What I want to emphasize here is that with the Society of Actuaries, uh, after you get your ASA, you have to make a choice of which of those six specialty tracks you'll go down. So based on where you work, what you're doing, uh, perhaps, what your boss uh, advises, or maybe even what your boss tells you you're going to do. Uh, you pick a track that relates to the area of actuarial work uh, you're doing and will be planning to do. So they, they vary from uh, corporate finance to retirement benefits uh, to individual life and so on. So each track, uh, for the most part, and there's some slight differences from track to track, has uh, three exams, um, four e-learning modules and a seminar. That FAC at the end is another seminar, the fellowship admissions course, where you complete your uh, uh, professionalism education. And uh, the best part is at the end of that course, you receive your certificate that you are now a fellow of the Society of Actuaries. But again, one of the things that uh, is, is important to be thinking about, but don't have to think about, commit to it until you get uh, past your ASA, is which of those six tracks am I going to go down? And the uh, and it's almost always a conversation between uh, uh, the actuary who's taking the exams um, and their boss or the director of the actuarial program um, or whoever they're working with as their mentor to help them uh, uh, chart the best pathway to complete their uh, actuarial education. So that's my uh, high level view of what the uh, SOA is up to. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Ken to, to do the same thing for the CAS. Thanks, Stuart. And uh, Morgan, you can go ahead to the next slide. A uh, little background on myself. My name is Ken Williams. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I am one of the staff actuaries at the CAS. Been there about, um, I guess, three and a half years now. Uh, prior to joining the CAS, I worked at a, a mid-sized regional insurance company, uh, one of the Farm Bureau insurance companies uh, for 26 years. And um, while not doing it full-time like Stuart did, I, I've been teaching classes at Illinois State University for a little over 20 years on a part-time basis. So um, both of us have kind of similar backgrounds in, in education uh, before we came on as staff actuary. So um, like Stuart mentioned, we're gonna talk a little bit about you know, just the pathway for the CAS. And um, as Stuart also mentioned, we've got a transition plan going on. So uh, this is our current pathway. Um, I, I did note that, um, uh, we have an old version of this slide. It says there's no way to attain your CS credentials. It's supposed to say there's no one way to attain your CS credentials. There's people who take exams who probably feel like they cannot get your credentials, but you can. But, um, and, and really Stuart's track is the same way. There's no defined path you have to take. Most of the exams you can take, whichever one you think is most applicable to your next step. Um, obviously some of the exams do assume you have knowledge from previous exams, but um, you're basically allowed to sign up for whatever exam you wanna sign up for. So looking at our path for 2022, um, the, um, the first line on this path where it says DEs, exam one and exam two, 
those are exams actually the CAS doesn't give. Uh, most of our candidates will get those through the SOA exams. So the VEEs are the same validation by educational experience uh, that Stuart talked about earlier. Um, exam one is exam P on the society side. Exam two is exam FM. So um, most of our candidates get those through the SOA. You can get them through other organizations like the, uh, the IFOA, for example. Exam 3F is the one that's circled there. That's the equivalent of the SOA's exam IFM, uh, which Stuart mentioned that exam is going away. So it's also going away for us. And then we have two um, online modules called online course one and online course two. Uh, those are where you learn online. And then at the end of that learning, you take an online exam to verify your learning. So um, very similar to what the SOA says, we have a combination of exams validation by educational experience and online learning modules. So that's kind of the foundation to get you kind of moving towards an associateship. Next level is when at this point, usually you have a full-time job and you're working towards getting that associateship while you're, while you're working. We have two exams called uh, Modern Actual Statistics 1 and 2. Uh, those are basically introducing you to data analytics and data analysis tools. Um, we have our course on professionalism. Uh, the, the, the SOA gives two different courses. We incorporate everything into one course. So we have one two-day course on professionalism, which covers the professional responsibilities of actuaries, our standards of practice, um, other professional documents. We also cover some communication skills within that course. And uh, starting this year, we're actually introducing some uh, DE&I uh, concepts with that course. So once you get through those, our exam five and exam six, those are our kind of basic level exams for um, rate making and reserving and financial reporting. So once you get through those, you have your associate designation, your ACAS, you're now considered a, an actuarial, an, an actuary, you, you get membership within the CAS. Uh, for those of you who choose to, you can also work towards a fellowship designation. And those are three exams, exams, exams seven, eight, and nine. All of those exams are essentially advanced topics on what you learned on exams five, six, and some of the other exams. So those are just more advanced topics um, if you wanna pursue your fellowship. So that's our current exam path. We can flip to the next slide. And um, no, this, doesn't, this doesn't really change too much. Um, we're, we're with exam three up going away, we're introducing a new online course three. Um, online course three will uh, focus a, quite a bit on data analytics. Um, and, and really some of the data tools that you're gonna to wanna to be using as actuaries. Uh, we know that actuaries today are working with more and more data. And what this course is gonna do is really give you some of the fundamental concepts of just working with data. Uh, we often concentrate so much about learning how to do modeling and how to run R and how to run Python. This course is really gonna talk about how do you actually compile the data before you start? How do you make sure the data is clean? And then once you do run your reports and you have a model output, how do you create visualization so you can show that to the people who want to see your output of your model? So it really focuses on the kind of the start and the end of a data analytics project. Um, also within that course, we're gonna talk about, you know, the ethics of data and things like that. So that course will roll out um, at the end of 2022 uh, for our candidates. So, and even though exam 3F is going away, um, if you have credit for 3F, if you have credit for IFM, if you get that course this year, that will essentially count towards the associate designation also. So you can have either online course or exam 3F through taking the SOA exam IFM. Either one of those will count towards associateship. So that's a brief kind of introduction to what our, our path is. Um, since the CS really focuses just on property casualty insurance, we just have the one exam path. So um, if you're working the CS, you're probably going down a property casualty path or a general insurance path. So we go to the next slide real quick. And this is, um, I think we may have even copied this from the SOA because the, the color scheme looks very similar to what Stuart just showed you. So, uh, but this is really just what the, um, the change is from 2022 to 2023. Um, one thing we are kind of doing is, um, and this maybe gets back a little bit what Stuart talked about, about giving you a little bit more actuarial knowledge earlier in the exam path is we're, um, we're really encouraging candidates to take those online e-modules earlier in the path uh, before our pathway kind of had those modules later. And we're really trying to focus on those and be a little bit earlier in the pathway. So once you get those first couple of exams, uh, maybe you're still in university or just out of university, um, we're trying to really focus on those modules a little bit earlier and getting that kind of actual knowledge earlier in the process. 
Um, one thing we did do with those online courses is if you're a full-time student or if you're not full-time employed as an actuary, um, those courses are half price. So you do get a discount on those courses if you're a, uh, still in school. So that's um, briefly our exam path. And again, we'll, 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 we'll be happy to take questions on our exam path when we get done with our presentation. There's not a whole lot of slides yet left yet. So let's go ahead and finish uh, the slides we have. So go ahead and flip the next slide, Morgan. Um, one thing that you may not, if you don't already know, you'll learn very quickly is um, the exams are hard. Um, if, if you, you know, this is something people find out when they take the exams, but um, uh, the typical pass rates for, for most actuarial exams hover between 40 and 50%. Uh, so it's, it's definitely, if you're gonna go down the exam pathway, you kind of have to be um, you know, ready to fail, I guess. Um, uh, most folks who take actual exams tend to do well in school. They tend to be um, you know, very good at math and statistics. So it's a little bit of a surprise. You take these exams and you study really hard and, and you don't pass. So uh, don't, that let be, don't let that be discouraging. And we're gonna give you some tips in the next few minutes to hopefully get that ratio higher for you. But it is, um, it is a difficult set of exams and the pass ratios do tend to be around 50%. So uh, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna fail uh, at least a few times when you're going the exam path. Yeah, Ken, can I make a comment? Sure. Yeah, um, one thing that's important to note uh, when you're deciding should I try an exam or not, failure is not public, uh, passing is. So both societies publish the list of names of people who passed their exams, uh, but they do not publish lists of people who have failed their exams. And an employer might ask you, did you ever fail an exam? But they, they can't find out um, unless you tell them. And, and what, what that leads to, uh, at least from my perspective, is sort of when in doubt, give it a shot. Um, because there's also no limit to how many tries you can have. So. Uh, we don't want you to fail many, many, many times before you pass, but there's no rule about if you failed three times, you can't, you can't try again. So if you feel like you're ready, you've studied the subject in school, gone through all the steps Ken's going to talk about, and you feel ready, um, there's uh, the, the risk that you're taking is the fee for the exam and the time you sit in the room. Uh, but, but failure is something that's not reported publicly. Great point, Stuart. Okay, let's um, go ahead and, and flip to the next slide and we'll talk about what you need to do to prepare for these exams. So maybe your pass ratio is a little bit higher than 50%. So um, this is just you know Ken's advice and I'll, I'll be happy to get Stuart's advice here, but this is my advice on the best way to prepare for exams is um, anytime you're taking an exam, both the SOA and the CAS uh, publish essentially study guides, which is what you're expected to learn for this exam. So if I was getting ready to learn something I was gonna be tested on, I'd wanna know what that material is. So look at the exam syllabus, um, look at what the learning objectives are. Uh, both societies kind of give you a list of um, either required readings or suggested readings to learn that material. You know, go out and get that um, and get that syllabus material. Um, set up a realistic study schedule. So you know, plan ahead. Um, don't think you're going to study seven days a week because you're not going to. So that's why I said realistic. And we'll, we'll cover a, a, just a potential study schedule in a few minutes. And then, you know, learning just from the syllabus is, is pretty difficult. So there's a lot of good tools out there. Uh, both the CS and SOA, we offer our own study manuals. And there's also a lot of really good organizations out there um, that will help you pass the exams. So the offerings from third parties. You know, being an employee of the CS, I can't really endorse one of those third party uh, third parties, but there are a lot of good ones out there where you can, um, they can help you get the, through the exams. Uh, the one thing I'll say though is they, 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 they sell study guides, they do not sell the syllabus. So uh, the material they're selling is a way to assist you in learning the material. Uh, don't rely on that 100%. You can get through some of the early exams by just using third party vendors. Um, you will not get to the later exams just using third party vendors. So uh, go back to the material. Um, yeah, I want to I want to I want to echo that really strongly, Ken, because one misconception is that the people who make those study guides uh, know something. Well, they don't. I mean, they know a lot. They're smart. They, they've studied the material. They've they've done everything they can to figure out what's on the exam. But the committees that write the questions for the exam don't look at those study guides. They look at the source material. So I still remember getting a complaint from a candidate. 
you asked a question on Chebyshev's inequality and it wasn't in my study manual. The answer is no, but it was in the textbook we asked you to read. And, and so the, keep in mind, and it goes even as Ken says for the later exams, the people writing the questions, they're doing it from the source material. And, and, and their promise to you is at source material and nothing else, that if you've mastered the source material, you can work, answer the question. Exactly. And we, I think we even had one pretty recently where the study, the vendor, I think had a mistake in their study guide. And <laughs> the question just happened to be on that, that material. Again, we don't look at the study guide, so we don't know what's in there. But the, the question was often that mistake and a lot of people got that question wrong <laughs> because mm -hmm. the study guard was wrong. <laughs> so um, again, they're, they're, I'm not gonna say not use them, but make sure you do go back to that source material. Um, find a study group. Some of us, some, you know, personally for me, I do best by studying alone. A lot of people study better in a group. And so you can find yourself a study group. Uh, the larger employers tend to have their own study groups uh, with the online uh, worlds now, there's lots of online study groups. So uh, join a study group. The one thing study groups are usually really good at is keeping you on task. So it's, it's you don't want to fall, you're not going to fall behind if you're in a study group. And then in addition to learning the material, make sure you're ready to take the exam. So you know, you're allowed to take a calculator to the exam. I think, I think Stuart, you're still allowed to have calculators on your exams too. I know they are for the CAS. But I'm sorry. are you guys allowed to have calculators still for all your exams? We still use the, uh, uh, the, the same ones we've been using for years. Um, and particularly for the FM exam, financial mathematics, yeah. you absolutely have to have the, the Texas Instruments be a business analyst calculator with you because it has built-in functions that uh, you don't have access to any other way. So, uh, and Ken may talk about this a little bit. Um, uh, when we talk about computer-based exam, some of the earlier exams, all the computer's doing is delivering you the question. You're reading it on the screen, you make your multiple choice test, but you're not actually using the computer as a computer, in which case a calculator is rather essential because you don't have any other calculating device even though the computer in front of you is a terrific calculating advice, you can't use it as one. But when you get to later exams from both of us, that changes. So I'll let you go ahead and, because it's not all that different, mention that what happens when you get up. I don't know which exam you start this with now, maybe, but. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so like Sir said, make sure you know your calculator, make sure you know how to use them, make sure you can save time, because these exams, you know, these exams, you, you think they're three or four hours long, but you're pressed for time with these exams. So the quicker you can work questions, the better off you're going to be. And then get to know that CBT environment. Um, I know that the CAS, we offer kind of sample exams on our website um, that kind of show you what it's going to look like. Because the first time you sit down in an exam center, you know, the, 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 the less pressure you can have on yourself for stuff other than the exam, the better off you're going to do. So if you know the exam center, you know what the computer is going to look like, that's just going to make your exam experience better. So. Um, try to, as best you can, find out, um, you know, I think, I think Stewart's, I think the SOA still uses Prometric. We use a company called Pearson View uh, to give our exams, you know, find out what you can about those centers and what your experience is going to be like. So there's no surprises on exam day. And then practice as much as you can. I mean, work as many practice problems as you can find. Um, try to do some simulated exams where you actually sit down and, and take an exam for four hours and just kind of get, prepare yourself as much as you can um, for the exams. Stuart, any other thoughts on how to prepare? Well, that pretty well covers it. The last one's just critical uh, because as Ken mentioned, the time flies. So what the practice gets you is, is as much you're building your speeds. You start to recognize certain types of problems. So you, so you can attack those ones really quickly. So you'll have more time left over for the ones that are more challenging where you say, oh, I'm going to have to actually think through this one because I don't I don't recall a problem where I do A, B, C, and D and I'm done. I've actually got to drive something, work through some calculations, think about it. So you want to maximize your time for those questions. One way to do that is to minimize your times on sort of the, the sort of standard routine questions that, that tend to be on the exams over and over again. When I, I know like on our, on our multiple choice exams, every question is worth the same amount of points. So if you yeah. can get a question, you know what answer very quickly and you can get that one out of the way, um, you know, that, that's two points for you. And so it's, it's good to figure out which questions you can answer quickly. And, and part of taking exams is, is figuring out when you read a question, how long is that question gonna take you to do? 
And if you say, hey, this question is going to take me 10 minutes to do, maybe you've missed that. You skip that one and come back to it later at the time. So, um, go ahead and next slide, Morgan. Just got a couple left here. Just one thing I wanted to mention, because I, I, a lot of folks who are in college don't really necessarily realize this, but um, the, the companies, they want you to pass exams. They want you to, the knowledge you obtain from exams benefits you and it benefits the company by you having knowledge. So most companies are going to encourage you to pass exams as best you can. So uh, most companies offer between 100 and 150 study hours at work uh, to take exams. Um, a lot of them will give you kind of um, set aside spaces so you can study. And I really do encourage you to take these with, I know a lot of um, a lot of study materials now is online, especially those third party vendors. And so it's tempting to sit at your desk and study, but if you're at your desk, people can stop by and talk to you. Your boss can come in and ask you to work questions. So if you get study time at work, find somewhere away from your desk to study, even if you have to take your computer with you. Um, so it, it really makes sure your time. Uh, for most entry level analysts, you know, passing exams is, is a big part of your performance review. So um, you generally speaking, or if you pass exams, you're gonna get a, a better salary increases and more, more potentially work assignments. So it really is, when you first get a job, it really is important to really focus on those exams. Uh, most companies will either pay your registration fees or they'll um, reimburse you for them and they'll buy some study material and seminars. And that will, again, the company will have different policies on that, it'll vary by company. Uh, they may pay for one seminar per exam. So if you fail, you don't get another seminar or something like that. Uh, a lot of companies will give you the day before the exam and the day of the exam off. Um, so that, that kind of helps. Um, I always used to love having exams on Tuesday because I would get the, the weekend and then Monday to study and then take the exam on Tuesday. So, And then often just passing an exam by itself gets you a raise. So it's not, it's not something you have to wait for the end of the year. If you pass an exam, you get a raise and sometimes you'll get a bonus. Um, the company I used to work for, if you pass the exam the first time, you got a one-time passing bonus. So. Um, so you do get a lot of support from the companies for, for most companies to, to, to pass the exam. So um, really take advantage of that um, because it's, you know, it, it, it's it, passing the exams is, is a lot of work. And um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but take advantage of that company supply time. And I think maybe our last slide or second to last slide. So this is just an example of, you know, a study schedule. So this is what I would do when I was working. And obviously if you're a college student now, it might be a little different, but this is how I would kind of start every year. And, and one thing worth noting is, you know, for the CAS, our exams are about the first week of May. Um, I generally started studying in January, um, but you'll notice in January, all I was doing was taking time at the office. So I would just take the, uh, you, get, um, you get that 120 hours, 120 hours, it takes a while to burn 120 hours and you're gonna still be working. So. Um, at my company, they really wanted to take one hour a day. So you take one hour a day, 120 hours, that takes about five months to go through. So um, that really is to encourage you to start studying early. So this is how I would study. I would you know, take an hour at work and then starting about four months before, or about three months before the exam, I'd start taking a couple hours, three days a week. So you can see I'm kind of building myself up and taking more and more hours as I get close to the exam. But um, this is what worked for me. And what was really important for me was to have days off. So you'll notice on this calendar that I never studied on Tuesday or Friday after work. I wanted to have two days a week where I didn't have to worry about studying when I came home from work. And on Sunday and Saturday, I would usually try to get up and study in the morning and be done by noon. So that way I had all those, those days for me to study also. So this is just what worked for me. Um, it may not work for you, but I encourage you, you know, when you start getting ready for an exam to build a schedule like this, so you can kind of tr map out how many hours you're going to take. And, um, as you pass a couple of exams, you'll learn how many hours you need. Some people learn quickly. Some people need more time. So this is about a 300-hour study schedule. I think it's 280. Um, some people can pass with 150 hours on the exam. Some people can pass with, you know, take some four or 500 hours. Um, so this is just, you know, I would encourage you to build something like this and then track it. Make sure you're getting those hours. And if, if you're not getting your hour day at work, maybe that's a discussion you need to have with your boss or something. Say, hey, boss, I need... I, I can't get my study time in that work. You know, I need to make time for that. So, um, but this is just a, a schedule for me. And you'll see as, as it built up, you know, later I took more hours at work. I also took more hours um, outside of work. Um, one more advice I have, you know, even though it says eight hours the day before the exam at work, that's just because the company gives you the day off. Um, I would not encourage you to study eight hours the day before an exam. Um, just like anything else, you want to make sure you're prepared for the exam. 
So try to relax as much as you can the day before the exam. You'll, for something you're not quite sure about, focus on that a little bit, but you're not gonna pass the exam the day before the exam. Um, so review what you can, but really you know, try to relax as much as possible that day. Make sure you eat well. Um, if you're into exercise, try to get some exercise that day. So really make sure you're mentally ready for that exam the next day. So I, I would not encourage you to study eight hours the day before the exam. Let's go ahead to the last. I think we just have a couple more slides, one more slide maybe, and we'll, we'll open up for questions the rest of the session. So while, while it's advancing, um, I'll just mention that uh, the other thing I, I did um, was you know, not only take notes, but sort of take notes on your notes and at every sort of phase, try to whittle it down to where you got what you really needed to have memorized. If you could get it on a page or two before the exam, um, that would be really helpful, particularly if there are key formulas that you know, you're really confident you have to have them memorized before you go into the exam. So if you've got that formula sheet, a lot of people like flashcards, um, I, I didn't know, you could do that back when I was there. I just had paper, uh, but used to just fill a sheet up with formulas and you know try to make sure I'd memorize them or have somebody uh, read them. You know, give me the name of the formula and see if I could recite it back from memory. Um, and so the idea of trying to condense the really really important stuff into something small, because that's about the only. As Ken said, you can't read learn the whole syllabus that day before, but you can cram those last few formulas into your short term memory. Yeah, I, used, I did do flashcards. I had a little index card. And something my boss taught me was he had two shoe boxes and he would basically read the flashcard. If you knew the answer, you put it in one shoe box. If you didn't know the answer, you put it in another shoe box. And hopefully all the, shoe, all the cards ended up in the, you know, the, I know the answer shoe box at, at long term, but that way you kind of, what you knew and what you didn't know, you could kind of separate there. So, so that's, the, um, that's the entirety of our prepared material. So we'd love to have, you know, questions or you know you guys give your comments on if you passed exams so far what worked for you to pass exams so maybe the other folks can learn from you and you can either use the raise hand feature in zoom or you can also type your meeting down in the um, the chat or type your question in the chat Yeah, you all have any questions, go ahead and drop it in the chat. Or I saw um, somebody raise their hand earlier when we were talking about, um, I think it was on the uh, SOA part. Um, if you all have any questions, either for Ken or Stuart, or both, or if you want to talk about um, exam prep or anything, um, that's what they're here for. Um, oh, there it goes. OK, here's a question. Yep. Um, how do you handle not passing exams? So um, one of our favorite sayings is, uh, uh, I hope you're all fans of the movie, The Princess Bride, uh, because one of our, our favorite sayings is when you, when you take our exams, sometimes you just have to get used to disappointment. And, and the fact is almost no one goes through without failing. Um, I think I'm a pretty bright guy, but I, I didn't pull it off. Um, I know a few people who did, uh, but that's, by, that's a very small, uh, group of people. So um, you just, you have to accept it uh, and move on. And the, the real key is to figure out then, what do I have, what do I need to do next to get over that hump? What, what did I miss? Um, you get some sort, depending on the exam, uh, and for us, it, it, from some, some exams do it one way, some another, you do get some feedback. Uh, for a lot of exams, there's model solutions put out there, but there's ways to find out kind of how you did and, and where your weaknesses were. And, you know, use that up, that feedback um, uh, to uh, do better the next time. The other thing I'll say from my experience, and, and I don't know if Ken's had the same, most of the time I did not leave an exam knowing how I did. Um, and the one, the one time I remember, I absolutely knew how I did. I absolutely knew that I passed and I didn't. So that was, that was a bit crushing, um, but um, it's just, uh, well, apparently my answers weren't the ones they were looking for and I passed it the next time. That was, um, uh, part of it for me was probably like you mentioned, you never really know when you walk out of the exam, did I pass or fail? You certainly can feel better about some than others. Um, so every time I failed an exam, 
I probably thought it was more likely than not that I was going to fail. So that was really on me more than I wasn't prepared. Um, there was never a time, and maybe I was fortunate, there was never a time that I felt like I was prepared for the exam going in that I didn't pass it. So and again, maybe I was just lucky. But most of the time I failed, I pretty much knew I probably wasn't as prepared as I could be. Maybe I knew enough to pass the exam, but I wasn't as prepared as I could be. So that was kind of the way it was for me. There was, there was one exam, I, I, I think it was exam two. It was, there was a probability exam back at the time. There was a separate calculus and probability exam. I took a probability exam and I was sick that day. I didn't feel well. And I, I thought I'd completely bombed the exam. And, and two months later, I got a pass result. I still, to this day, don't know how I passed that exam, but that was the one I got lucky on. So. Yeah, I had the same balance. So I, I failed one, I knew I passed, but I still don't know how I passed the accounting exam. Um, and I never, Never wanted to ask them to regrade my paper to see if I really did pass. Um, I'll take one I see on here about about our exams. Uh, exam changes to PNFM. Yes, we'll be we'll be working on the new sample pool for those exams. Um, keep in mind these are those exams have been trimmed a little bit. So if you do work with the current sample questions, you're you're good, and you even know some things you won't be tested on, which can never hurt. Uh, but we're, we're trying not to, to have too much overlap between now of time of presenting a set of practice questions that relates to an exam that's in the future when we're still giving the current version. So in the next few months, we'll, we'll have a, a, a trim down set uh, available for those preparing for the uh, September and October transition to the new syllabus. And then how many e-learning modules? So in the old system, the Fundamentals of Actuarial Practice course um, I had uh, eight e-learning modules, and we've now reduced the number of modules to seven. Two of them are those new ones I talked about that were at the bottom of those first two columns. And then the part called Fundamentals of Actuarial Practice now has five modules. So instead of eight total to complete the, that requirement, you need to do uh, seven modules. Uh, and therefore one less module and one less end of module assessment. So Ken, how did you stay motivated throughout your process? Um, that, that's um, I mean, certainly the, I mean, to me, it was, it was the journey, you know, I, I definitely wanted to hit the finish line. Um, I remembered um, we used to have, I used to make, you know, study guides back, back when we were much more focused on paper. Um, I had, we had study manuals for all the exams and every exam had a, like a cartoon on it where you're getting closer to a finish line. So to me, it was really the journey in finishing. You know, certainly the fact that if you've got a job, you know, you, you know, you get an exam raise, if you're going to pass the exam. And the other thing for me was, and this is something I, I learned a lot from my prior boss was you're going to put in the hours at some point, why not put them in as much as you can early? So um, you are gonna fail occasionally, but it really was, you know, I wanna get the exam done this time so I don't have to study this material again in six months. Uh, so that was, that was really my motivation is one, the career path and the advanced opportunities you get in addition to the salary raise and then two, just, you know, I don't wanna take this exam again, I wanna get through it this time. That was my motivation probably. Yeah, mine was a similar combination. For the early exams, I was still in school and it was really viewed as a competition. And there are some other guys that I, there's no way I was gonna let them have more exams than me by the time they were finished. So uh, there was a bit of that. And of course, knowing that it would help, help down the road. Um, but I'll have to say that for the, the fellowship exams, um, it was the, the pressure from, from my employer that was paramount. Um, so that not only the rewards that it get for passing, but unfortunately, most employers also have penalties for failing. Um, and so there's at some point where they'll give up on you and, and you don't want that to happen. Um, I did have a direct message come in. Um, somebody asked, how do I study for exam SCAM with two months to exam date and I haven't started studying yet? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> well, the uh, yes, <laughs> I, I'm going to give you something in two months. Um, this is something it worked for, for an actuary, and I won't say his name. Ken, you can ask me afterwards. It's someone I'm sure you know well. Um, 
but said the way he always studied was he never read the book at all. He just he just found old exam questions and then read, tried to figure out where in the book he needed to look to figure out how to solve them. Uh, he was an extremely bright guy, which probably helped a whole lot in his case. Uh, so I'm not necessarily going to recommend that, but, but you've got to really be efficient in trying to figure out what's essential. Uh, as an educator, um, I don't like that answer because you know, we would like to view our goal as we're not just testing you and seeing if you can pass a test. We, we want you to actually know the material because we believe it's really important that you know it to be successful as an actuary and to be a, a really good uh, professional when you're done. Um, and so, you know, but, but we know from a candidate's perspective that the, the prize is getting the pass as opposed to the knowledge. But it's tough. That's a really short time frame for a lot of material. I think it's, some of it would depend on if you've had that material already in your college courses or not. If, you, if, you, if it's totally brand new to you, two months is going to be awfully tough. If it's you've learned that you've had those classes that cover a lot of that material and you're just going to have to relearn it for the exam, that's maybe a little different story. So a question about checking source materials. So each exam has, a, the syllabus is not just the learning objectives of what you should know, but a list of readings. So um, there'll, be, there'll be specific books listed. Um, so I'll talk about the STAM exam because that was just brought up. Um, and a little plug for myself, because one of those books uh, that happens to be uh, listed on, on that exam, uh, I'm a co-author of it. But again, that book is listed. The chapters in the book that are on the exam are listed down to chapter and section. And as I mentioned before, the, the people writing the questions, they look to that material and they actually have to prove uh, before their question is accepted that it can be solved by looking at page uh, whatever, but they have to actually have the page or section reference to say, this is where in the recommended textbook, you can find what you need to know to answer the question I just wrote. And so the part of the syllabus document, uh, and that's for, for all our exams, uh, tells you what, what, what the official readings are for those exams. Um, and so that's again, what the exam committees base their questions on. Gotcha. I think for the I think for the early exams it, it's it's I mean, like probability like you mentioned there's only one way to there's, there's probability is one thing I don't think there's one required reading for right so one of these readings you should read from yeah so for the P and FM exams um, we have about six books that we recommend any one of them will be sufficient again these are very generic subjects uh, they're not specialized in that sense so any one of those books and the chapters that are listed uh, will be satisfactory so I, I did. I should have left those two off because for those, the exam committees actually go by the topics covered and they just say, is that topic uh, legitimate for asking a question on? And they don't check all six books to make sure that it's in each and every one of them. And, and part of that is if you've taken a prob an equivalent probability course in college and it didn't use one of those six books, but you used one of the 20 other comparable books out there, uh, you'll be fine in your preparation. So that one is a little bit different. Uh, the FM is a specialized exam uh, that has carved out subjects uh, that are viewed as important for actuaries. Uh, but there, the authors of all those books we've recommend um, are all actuaries. They're all writing the exact same thing. And it really comes down to whose writing style you like better as they wrote their textbook, as opposed to who's got the right answers and who doesn't. Because they all have exactly the same material in them. So it's just a matter of taste of, of which book you like, or if an instructor's picking a book, which one they like to teach from. And so um, I, I will we... mention real quick, and I think, I think Stuart, the essay is similar, but uh, a lot of those reading materials, I mean, they are in books and the books can be expensive. The CS, we have our own library. So if you if you have a material you can't, you don't want to pay for, you can't afford, um, just notify the CS and we'll, we'll let you borrow a book for you know, six months or whatever. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, did you all answer Emmanuel's question in the chat? No, nope. no, nope, that's one I've uh, I've still got to do. That's that's for me. Um, so the question <laughs> is, if we assume knowledge of uh, what's in the VEEs? Why do you make us do it? So uh, this first goes back to something uh, 
uh, Ken said, you, you can take the exams in any order uh, for the most part, um, but each exam, when you read about the syllabus, it'll say, we assume you know certain things. So it's absolutely correct that we assume some knowledge, uh, but we assume that knowledge as it's directly applied in that exam. Um, and, and I'll say, and, you know, if you sort of take that to the extreme, uh, maybe you could just take the last exam and that should be good enough because it's built on all the others in some way. But, but the fact is there's lots of material in every component that may not exactly show up on the next one, but it's still important. So particularly the VEEs, um, <clears throat> there, won't, there won't be, we would want you to know economics and accounting and, and the corporate finance as you go forward. But there's a lot in those VEEs that doesn't get covered, <clears throat> excuse me, on a, on a subsequent exam. And we think once you've got that from a basic university course, uh, you have what you need to know to, to move forward in your career. And some of it would be uh, uh, essential, but just pieces of it to do a specific thing that you might encounter later on. Sure. Yeah, you all have any more questions? Um, I know we're closing in on the hour mark. Um, if you all have any more questions, I'm Stuart and Ken, are you all um, available or willing to connect with students um, in the future? Oh, Nancy. Uh, yes, just a quick question. Um, what if you start taking, let's say, SOA exams, um, and then later in life you realize you prefer the CAS pathway or vice versa? Uh, are those transferable or how does, how does that go? Good question. So in the current framework, there's four common components. So there's no, not really transfers. There's just four, but two of the VEEs, and, and on our side, we call them PNFM. I think on Ken's picture, they were just called exam one and exam two. <clears throat> and then those two VEEs, so they're in common. Uh, uh, but that's, these days, that's, that's as far as it goes. Um, there are certainly people um, who start down one pathway and realize their career plans are taking them in the direction where they would, would rather go with the other organization and, and find that more beneficial to their career. Um, but they, they just essentially lose some of those credits uh, in that process. One thing I will add, though, is that even though we, we test, we have different tests for a lot of those early data analytics exams, it's, it, for the most part, it's very similar material. So if you've passed the, the CAS MAS 1, and now you've decided to go on the, the SOA side and you're, you're gonna take exam STAM or their exam PA. A lot of the material is overlapping. So you don't have to relearn the material from scratch. It's stuff you've already learned. And you know, hopefully that's a little bit less effort to pass that the SOA exam if you pass the CS one already. Okay, so you, but you still have to take those exams. So you, you probably might be easier for you, but they will still need to be taken pretty much is what you're saying. Correct. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nancy, for asking a question. And thank you, everyone, for asking um, and participating with us today in our session. Um, if you all have any questions, uh, future that you all have, like for Ken or Stuart regarding the CAS or the SOA, I will um, include their uh, contact information in the email that I'm sending that I send out um, after every session. So, um, Yes, I just want to thank everyone for participating and attending the session. Um, I want to thank Stuart and Ken for presenting and answering uh, everyone's question and just being a big help today um, and connecting with students. So yes, uh, I will be sending out an email uh, this week. Uh, it will include this PowerPoint, uh, the recording link, so it, this was recorded today, and so we, we will be posting it on YouTube. Um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about our exam prep program, um, but our next session is May 4th, um, and it will be going over presentation skills. Um, and remember that you still have opportunities available, such as the resume review um, opportunity and the interview, the mock interviews. If you all are interested in participating in those because you are trying to get an internship or a job 
or anything, uh, please reach out because those resources are available to you all. Um, and then we also have our exam prep program, which focuses on exam FM, and it's for the October sitting this year. Um, and we kind of went over exam scheduling and how important that is. Um, we also touched on study group, studying alone or with a group um, and materials. So our exam prep program offers all of those different things. We offer uh, motivational, um, motivational, educational and financial resources. So we also do sponsorships and reimbursements for uh, exam FM and for future exams. Uh, so we know that the applications close next Friday. So if you are interested or want to learn more information, you can either reach out to me or you can um, search on our blackactuaries.org page where it just dives in a little bit more about the exam prep program. So if you are really interested in trying to get started with your exams, you can go ahead and get started here with IABA and uh, just you know help you get your foot, foot in the door. So thank you all. Um, Thank you, Ken and Stuart again. And uh, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for helping with everything. And I hope everyone has a great and safe night. And thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>